Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Shintaro Higashi Show with Peter Yu. Today, we're going to talk about the martial arts business. That's right. Uh, as you guys know, Shintaro has been in this business for a while, and he's seen a lot of success. And I'm sure there are a lot of people who would love to be in this business and yeah. also get some uh, advice from you and then basically hear how you did it. Yep. So there's many ways to make money in the martial arts business, right? Mm. And when you think like I'm in the martial arts game, the industry, first and foremost, people think brick and mortar dojo, right? right? Like a physical store where you could go actually learn mm -hmm. martial arts, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a very interesting world because people think, hey, you know, some people are very old school. They're like, oh, you shouldn't make money doing martial arts, right? Martial right. arts should be free almost, mm -hmm. you know, but it is a service, right? And mm -hmm. The person who learned it took many, many years to acquire that skill and you're, you know, learning that skill and the people's lifestyle depends on it. Right. Right. So it is sort of a business too. I don't want to call it a business. Mm -hmm. And it, to me, it's more than a business because it's a very lifestyle oriented thing and it's an mm -hmm. intergenerational thing. Mm -hmm. But that's the first, first thing most people think about, about is the dojo. Right. So yeah, let's kind of go through the whole process of how you start a dojo and grow it and whatnot. So let's start from the beginning. How do you even go about starting a dojo. Well, mm, that's a good one. Steps. Yeah. First, you have to be good at martial arts, right? Right. <laughs> actually, you don't even have to even be good at martial arts. You know, you could just actually do martial arts for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And this is the problem. You spend 10 years, 15, 20 years training mm -hmm. in martial arts, learning a skill. And with no business background, you're like, all right, let me enter into some of these business contracts and right. know, long term lease deals and then uh, start a business. You know, I have right. no idea how a PL works or what the expenses are but I, i'm just do it you know right um and so i think that's where a lot of people struggle uh, -huh. uh but first and foremost you have to have a martial arts background i think right you know and there's do you many think ways to go about it do you think yeah what are some other ways do you think you have to be at the like a professional level like you did or you don't well, have so to. you could do like judo and brazilian jiu-jitsu those are like show me sports right like show yeah. me that you're good mm. people can challenge you you have to be able to grapple you have to be able to hold your own Right. Because a big portion of the martial art is the combative element, mm -hmm. the non-cooperative drills, mm -hmm. right? A lot of the times, uh, everything is coordinated. For some martial arts, everything is choreographed. Mm -hmm. But judo and jiu-jitsu, it's not like that, right? right? So if you're doing a martial art like that, you need to be able to hold your own. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a student base of, I don't know, 30, 40 people, and then a challenger comes in, it's like, hey, let's go, sensei. You know, you've done right. judo for X amount of years, and you have that fancy belt, and then you get your butt kicked and tossed around you're gonna lose students right that's right? that's because like a unfortunate be... reality i guess you know right? yeah like... yeah that's just how it is you know so <laughs> you have to pick the martial art right mm -hmm. and there are some martial arts uh you know let's just throw out like tai chi or something mm -hmm. you know uh that you don't need it's not like a show me like hey let's let's work out right right people right. can't challenge you and you know discredit you by just challenging mm -hmm. you that's like right a physical confrontation right Right. And you could stand in front of the room and teach. I'm not saying anything wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Right. Taekwondo model is a little bit different than the judo model, mm -hmm. which is a little bit different than the BJJ model. So depending on different martial arts, the models are very different. Yeah. But the bottom line is you have to be good at it. Like one way or the other, pick a martial art and then you have to be yeah. good at it to teach. Yeah. yeah. You have to be good at it. I don't think you need to be a world champion or a tier one sort of an athlete, like mm -hmm. you call it. And I think sometimes the tier one athletes are the worst at running these businesses because it's like, oh, you know, why can't you do it? Why don't you understand it? I was able to do this when I was 11 years old. Right. <laughs> and they just don't understand right. the average layman's struggle of like, oh, I just don't have the coordination. I right. don't have the core strength to be able to physically do this, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, you know, it's very difficult for the world level top athlete to understand and get into the body of the average practitioner. Right. Right. right? I see. So you don't have to be the best. Mm -hmm. You do have to be good, I think, to a reasonable level. Level yeah. now <laughs> with Instagram and YouTube and everything. It's like everybody could just film you and put it on the internet and people and then, are going to criticize right. you. So it's like <laughs> you, you got to be decent, I guess, you know, right. especially now in this day. Right. All right. So you picked a martial art, you were good at it. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, you're decent yeah. enough to teach other people. So, and yeah. you threw out a lot of like acronyms like PNL and whatnot. So, let's kind of go from the beginning. Like, okay, so you want to start a business. What is the first step? You have to register somewhere or we'll get yeah, a lawyer? You get an LLC, right? It depends on, I think, uh, I don't know from state to state. I know in New York City, it's like you get an LLC and then you get mm -hmm. an EIN number. And now all of a sudden, you know, you have this corporation, right? This company. Right. And you could pick between like S Corp and C Corp and all these different options. Uh, I don't want to get too technical into right. that, but you need to establish some sort of right uh, corporate structure, 
right? You probably want to have some professional helping you. Definitely want professional yeah. help. You want an accountant in there. You want a lawyer in there, right? Mm -hmm. Making sure all the, right, all those things are tight. Right. You know, and then you got a bank account because, you know, mm -hmm. you're not going to do business like, hey, come in and sign up for judo twice a week and it's $200 a month. And then here's my bank account. Just deposit into that. Right. That's going to be, you know, some serious commingling thing happening and it's going to mm -hmm. be very difficult to keep track. Right, everything. right, right. Right. You need to keep track of the money coming in and the money going out. Mm -hmm. It's a separate right? bank, bank account. Yeah. Yeah. A separate bank account. And then that's essentially the essence of business. Right. Profit right. and loss. Right. How much right. is coming in? How much is going out? What's left at the end of it? You know, right. sometimes when you're starting a business, it's zero. Uh -huh. If you're lucky. Right. Right. You know, because in the beginning, you're losing money. Because you have to invest and spend money. You, to invest, you got to spend money. And you're at a negative in the beginning. Right. You know, and... Uh, the administrative stuff is very important, but then you need a location, especially if you're doing the right. dojo business because it's a brick and mortar store. Mm -hmm. Now you got to find commercial real estate, you know? Yeah. And then I, I'm sure you probably need some professional help with that as, with an agent and whatnot. I, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. And people kind of like, I don't want to work with no agent because I have to pay whatever it is and they take right. a fee. But they can really guide you, right? Right. Uh, but you have to take their guidance with a grain of salt because their objective is for you to sign the lease and they get paid. Mm -hmm. right so that's right. in their best interest to get the thing signed you know mm -hmm. but they have a lot of information and wealth of knowledge right that you want to tap into you know like, things about like yeah like rent increases property taxes like all those different things matter mm -hmm. right it's like oh you know it, it increases you know three percent every year or you know things of that nature like that could you have to grow too at a certain percentage to overcome right and then right? those agents those will kind of know more about the neighborhoods and foot traffic. They'll know about stuff. the neighborhood and foot traffic, things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. I don't want to get too into it because it's not a right. commercial real estate thing. And it's not my area of expertise. Right, know? right. But you do need to know what's out there and what mm -hmm. you're paying for, price per square foot. That's what sort of they go by New York City. Right. Right. And then so you don't want to get ripped off. It's the biggest yeah. expense. Right. I see. Right? So then, so, so you... Uh, open up bank account. You got yourself a dojo, like a space. Um, yeah. Well, actually, I kind of want to go back to what you said about the bank account and then how you get yeah. paid and whatnot. Sure. So I know uh, you you like to take the payment processing system and then just go with the credit card route, and other yeah. people don't want to. So what what do you have any thoughts on that part? Like just to, to yeah, get the so you need like a. Yeah, you need to like have a tool, right? Like right. a CRM tool, like a mm -hmm. client management system, mm -hmm. right? So money gets filtered in on a you know monthly basis, on a recurring basis. That's what you want. Right. Because you don't want to have to manually go in and charge every person every month and be like, mm -hmm. hey, this person paid, that person didn't pay, this person's paying cash. That mm -hmm. person. You put it in the system. I like the commitment system. People call it the contract system, but the contract has like a, sort of a taboo sound to it, right? It's like, right, oh, right, man, right. you got doing contracts at your dojo. It's like, yeah, you're committing six months. I'm committing six months, right? It's a, you know, it's a mm -hmm. two-way street here, right. buddy, you know? And then you put down the credit card, it just gets automatically charged. So you do mm -hmm. need some sort of software to have that, right? Mm -hmm. I use MindBody. I see. I see. Yeah. So then, so that that's how you, you know, keep track of your prof profit and loss. And that's one of the metrics. Um, well, so I use that for just uh, billing and mm -hmm. uh, email marketing, which I actually don't do a lot of. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's really just like appointments and keeping track right. of the membership, right? So I right. have like a me me membership management solution, right. so to speak. And then the losses and the expenses, like it goes through to QuickBooks Online. And then I, I kind of know, right? Yeah. Oh, I spent this much, spent that much. And then, you know, you could sort of see it on your bank account. Because if you, you know, go in and look at every item and it gets confusing. Right. right. But I sort of have what's the dollar amount that's in the account every mm. month. Has it gone up? Has it gone mm. down? And I have kind of like a general idea. I right. know people get really crazy about it, but I try never to be, you know, super focused on that. And mm. as long as it's above a certain threshold, I'm like, all right, good. Okay. You know, things are going in the right direction. So what are some of the other metrics you've, uh, pay attention to other than the mm. profit and loss so generally it's like you want the business moving right mm. and there are people going to get hurt there are people that are quit there are going to be mm. people that are moving away and you know people have issues with life right the mm. things happen in their life they have a kid whatever so you have to sort of account for that and you always want a steady stream of newcomers coming in right so you want to kind of have like this tight pipeline of leads coming in people mm. calling emailing how many people are calling in how many people are emailing in Right, mm -hmm. that's one metric, like leads, straight up leads. I right. have hundred people contact me saying they're interested. Mm -hmm. How many people are actually walking through the door? Mm -hmm. Right, 
Right. Out of the 100, maybe like 20. Mm-hmm. Okay, so 20% of people who are leads are walking through that door. Good. Mm-hmm. Right? So now you have a percentage there. Out of those people, how many people are actually signing up? Right. Right? And then out of those people, how many people stay one month? How many people stay five months? How many people stay? And you don't have to be meticulous about this, but you have mm-hmm. to have a general idea. Right. It's like right? It's that funnel idea, right? Yeah, it's like that funnel yeah. idea. And then, you know, you could see exactly where, right? It's like, oh, mm-hmm. man, like I'm looking at the numbers. And then we had only three signups this month. Like what happened? Mm-hmm. And then you could look at the leads. And it's like usually you get 100 leads. I only got 30 leads. Oh, shoot. Something not right with the Google. Right. I right? see. Google AdWords or my ranking on Google. Let me check that, mm-hmm. right? Uh, I only had three signups this month, but leads are the same. Trials mm-hmm. are the same. Right. Like someone's not signing them up. Okay, it's a follow-up issue, mm-hmm. right? Now let's look at the follow-up protocol that's not place. Like, are people following up? You know, for me, it was George for a while. So I was like, George doing his job. He always mm-hmm. did his job. He's great. Right. He's one of the best employees I've had. You know, he's amazing. <laughs> Good, good. So the yeah. um, so now that we're talking about the growth of uh, of your dojo, so you kind of mentioned uh, uh the Google ads and whatnot. Yeah. So what? How did you uh set up or you know some advice on that? Like a yeah, website? So yeah. You want to put yeah. So you want to have a website, right? You want to be visible on the internet, obviously, right. because you know people looking for a dojo, they're gonna look on Google, right? Mm-hmm. Judo Upper West Side or something like that. And you want to make right. sure your dojo comes up on the results of that. And right. Then you could actually pay, you know, for advertising on Google, right? Mm-hmm. You know, that little top sponsor, you know, yeah. right? So you want to pay for that kind of slot. You know, some people choose Facebook campaigns. Mm-hmm. Some people do direct mail marketing. Some people just do word of mouth like mm-hmm. we did for many, many years. You just want people calling in. You just right. want leads, people who are interested, mm-hmm. right? And that's what marketing is. Mm-hmm. You know, being in front of the people who are interested, Yeah. right? If you're interested in dance and if I'm like, hey, judo, 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 like, nigga, side for judo, not interested in it. Right, right. But I definitely do want to be in front of the people who want to do judo. Mm-hmm. And that's the marketing stuff, right? That's the marketing, mm-hmm. whether you do it through email lists or mm-hmm. website, right? Those are the, sort of the important things. And, you know, you don't have to keep track of everything. You don't have to do everything. You can just mm-hmm. do what works for you. And once right. you get to a certain level, you don't have to do any of it even. Then, right? you know, just uh, word of mouth happen organically. Yeah, you know, the dojo for a while, it was where I was pretty content with the numbers at KBI. And I was mm-hmm. just like, you know, sign up, sitting on the sidelines. Okay, I don't need to spend money on ads or do anything, you know, right. crazy to pump business in because we're close to max capacity. And, you know, I was happy with that. You don't want to just overgrow, I guess. You don't want to grow yeah, too yeah. much because then, yeah, it's Quality a it's a fine out. line. Yeah, because yeah, you get too many people. There's a sort of like a, this critical mass thing where it's like, okay, you're at a certain level and now the quality just declines right you know diminishing returns there you know you don't right. want to be there right okay. all right so that so you did your marketing you got your core group of people coming in yeah so then uh you have to keep them in retention yep. retention so retention is a huge one yeah you kind of yeah. touch it upon it with how, when you talked about giving contracts out mm. so let's kind of uh, dig deeper into that so contracts some people think of it as like a taboo yeah. practice so how did you approach it? Mm. That's a good one, man. You know, so the, like my father, who was an old school, old school guy, he just never did contracts. And it's like mm. you came in, you wanted to pay for the month, you pay for the month and, you know, whatever it was. And then mm. you, you're good. You, mm. you didn't even take credit cards. Like check your right. cash, right? <laughs> Come in, yeah. pay for one month and then you stay for one month. And at the end of the month, now it's like you're out of classes. What You know, it's like, oh, man, like I took a beating this month. I'm kind of tired. You know, it's cold outside. Mm. Let me just not go. One week goes by, two weeks go by. No one calls you. Right, right. You know, you take up uh, freaking something else. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know what I mean? So, and you know, there's a time that the instructor invests too. Mm-hmm. You know, you walk into a dojo and you're like, hey, I'm here for to do judo for a month and I teach you for a month and then you're out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're gone. It's like that hour, you know, that month that I spent teaching you hour by hour by hour, like that could have gone to someone else that's going to stick around for two months, three months more. Right. right? So it's like I'm kind of doing a disservice to the regular gen pop or the general population of the dojo by, mm-hmm. right, letting people just come in and leave. Right, right, right. They lose right, so practice like, partners and stuff. Lose practice yeah. partners and just time, time, yeah. right, attention. People right. who actually deserve my attention. Mm-hmm. Right? People who actually want to learn or mm-hmm. making themselves better. Like I want those guys to get the proper attention. Right, right. right? And one way of ensuring it is through automating some of this stuff. Guy mm-hmm. comes in, it's like, okay, you have three months, six months, or a one-year commitment. You commit, mm-hmm. I commit, mm-hmm. right? 
if you're going to be here, be here. Mm-hmm. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to care, right? Right. We're, you know, we dojo's not, you know, we're not trying to pump out thousands of people in here. It's not a McDojo. You know, mm-hmm. we don't have, uh, you know, 18-year-old green belts teaching your classes. Like, I'm physically teaching right. most of your classes, right? And mm-hmm. if it's not me, it's going to be one of my top black belts. So, mm-hmm. you commit because we're going to commit, right? Right. Pick between these three, and it's just going to be automated charging. Three months, six months, or one year. And it's mm. just going to go. And just mm. so you know, it's automatically renewing, so I don't have to think about it. Right, right, right. I don't like messing with money at the dojo. Right. I don't want to be like, hey, man, you didn't pay this month. Hey, man, you didn't pay that month. Uh, I don't want that. Right. Mm-hmm. Credit card gets declined. It sends an email automatically. Hey, fix this. Mm-hmm. Right. Email goes. They fix it on the back end. That way, I don't have to deal with that nonsense. Right. All I have to deal with people coming into the dojo, and I get to teach them judo. Right. That's what I could focus on. You that's know? your main focus. That's why you're. That's my main providing. focus. That's yeah. what. I'm, yeah, that's what I try to do. Right. With the business, and of course, there's people who have financial issues, and I can't make it. And then sometimes mm-hmm. you'll be like, "Okay, what is your deal?" Mm-hmm. And then you know, it's a case by case basis, right? Right, right, right. Somebody that's been committed to judo for a very long time, it's been two years. They just lost their job. They're having a really hard time at home. Mm-hmm. Judo's really good for them, mm-hmm. and they're a huge value add to the dojo because everybody likes them. Mm-hmm. It's a win-win right. having them there. Right, right. Those people, I will sometimes make an exception. Like, okay, right. get your job back, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. But generally, I try not to deal with any of that stuff mm-hmm. Yeah, the dojo. You know, it's kind of like good business practices, right? Right. So yeah. other than contract, what are some other strategies you've used or you've seen work well mm-hmm. to retain uh, your students? So different from kids and adults too, right? Right. So like the Taekwondo model, they have a lot of extrinsic rewards. Mm-hmm. You know, when a kid comes in and they're like, ah, oh, man, I don't really want to be here. I have to get in shape. My mom making me come here. Mm-hmm. Right? Maybe that kid's not motivated by just learning a technique or learning a kata right. or doing sparring or something. Maybe they're just afraid of confrontation. Mm-hmm. That kid might need a stripe, mm-hmm. might need a reward system. You get three stripes, you get a patch. What mm-hmm. kind of patch do I get? You get a dragon patch. You get three <laughs> of those, you get a lion yeah. patch. And right. You get a lion patch and you get three of those, you get a cool new gi. Right. Oh, oh, wow. Like that, you know? Yeah. So people like that, there's kids that like just, you know, positive reinforcement. They're like, hey, good job. Mm-hmm. Right. There's kids who seek out negative attention and you kind of have to manage all these mm-hmm. motivators for each and every one of these kids, essentially. Kids mm-hmm. are different business. Right. Mm-hmm. Kids are different. I see. Right? And you yeah. probably have to talk to their parents frequently talk to, to their parents yeah because yeah. you have to know what they what moves them right and yeah. you have to talk to them and you have to manage expectations and a lot of the times i got myself in trouble too when a parent is expecting their kid to be a world champion right and they're not gonna be a world champion right you know and that's that's managing expectations hard because everybody has different expectations some right, parents right. are just happy with the kid coming in and learning a couple of moves and working out mm-hmm. because they don't really care that much about martial arts they mm-hmm. care about the kid doing good in school or they mm-hmm. care more about chess because they were a chess player. Right, right, right. right. So you, when you talk to the parents and you have a couple conversations with them, you know why they're there. Mm-hmm. Right? And once you know their whys, then you could be like, okay, I'm going right. to teach them in a different way. Like I've had parents that are like, I'm from uh, the country of whatever and I was a judo champion kid and I want my kid to do judo, you know, all this stuff. And I'm like, okay. Mm-hmm. That's you know, this good, kid's not, right. whether he's motivated or not, whether the kid likes it or not, it doesn't matter because that parent is bringing that kid into the dojo. Right, right, right. So now I have to walk the fine line of, do I want this kid to like judo? Yeah. Or do I want to push him harder? Know, push him hard or, and the way the parents want me to push him. Right, right. But most of the time I won't do what's what the parent wants. You yeah. Know, and that's kind of bad, but I, I'll do what the kid needs. You know? Right, right. Um, that's when I was running most of the kids. I, I don't run the kids' classes anymore. Right. <laughs> And now there is no kids class because of the pandemic. No, but, right. you know? so, <laughs> so like those things are really important, I think. Yeah. You can't have a one size fits all and you have to be able to differentiate right. between each kid. And obviously you can't come up with a individualized lesson plan for each and every individual right. because you just can't scale that way. Right. right? So do, and then you and things, but you do some uh, grouping of kids, right? Like age wise and skill level wise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for a while we did like a tiny champs, and then we did like a kids one, kids two, and a youth judo, mm-hmm. right? Because the last thing a twelve year old wants is being in a group with six year olds and seven year olds. Right, right. You know, and it, it is time, cons- you know, consuming to break them off into those independent groups, and you can't mm-hmm. do it in the beginning, right? Mm-hmm. When you have a new program and you have six kids, you just can't do it. Right, right. You know, so for a while we had Monday, Fridays, kids. 
program. Mm. That's it. Especially mm. when I took it over from my father a couple of years ago, we didn't even have a kid's program. Mm. My dad's like, oh man, kids, you know, it's exhausting. I can't really do it anymore. I don't have any instructors. Mm-hmm. We're just going to focus on the adults. And that it was like that for a little while. Right, right, right. After I got them through the system, he's like, okay. Mm-hmm. Right? I see. We're going to focus more on the adult program. So, so then once it grows, yeah. you have to break it up, I think. I see. And then did you end up break, uh, creating a competition team for kids or anything like that? I know we t- talked about it a little yeah. bit. Competition is dangerous, man. Always right. for kids. And, you know, yeah. it's a double-edged sword. You know, and it is great for character building and there are many, many merits to it. But you mm. can't do judo once a week, go into a tournament and compete against a kid that does judo five times a week. Right, right, right. Because you're going to get smoked. That's yeah. just how it is. A once a week kid is never, almost never going to beat a five time a week kid. Mm. And it's going to have a very difficult time beating a three time a week kid. Mm. And maybe they could beat a twice a week kid if they have a lot of skill and mm. experience and athleticism and all this stuff. Right. right? There's just too many factors. You know, you go to a tournament, a kid could be a green belt, but wearing a yellow belt. People do this, you know? Mm-hmm. So, and it takes one bad fall in judo, right. especially. Get slammed hard for a kid to be like, I don't, I don't want to do this again. Right. You risk injury. Kids get injured right. in judo tournaments. Right. right? This right. I'm specifically talking judo. Uh-huh. I'm not talking about like taekwondo or some of these other ones where you could do form, which yeah. is an, you know, people have a, a opinion about this, but I think <laughs> it's amazing that you could do yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, judo needs a form division for kids. That's what it needs. You know, it needs, I'm going to start ranting and going, nuts. <laughs> I've been preaching this stuff nonstop. You need a white belt division. You need a first time judo competitor division where they're going out there and demonstrating these throws. Right. I mean, we have all right? the katas, you know. I don't yeah. know about kata for kids, but it's like, show yeah. us three of your best moves. And the kid goes out there like, oh, Sotogari, boom, oh, Tatoshi, yeah. And then it's like, oh, shoot, you know, everybody rounds applause. You give a thing, kid gets a medal, he feels good. Right, right. And then he looks over to the other mat and sees these like killers. Yeah. Smashing each other like, I want to do that. I see. Yeah. And then yeah. the sense they can say, when you're ready. Ready. Right? Right, right. What does that mean? You got to train more. These those kids train four times a week. They've been doing judo for three or four years. Mm-hmm. As opposed to like, kid starts judo, dad's like, I want him to compete. Mm. It's like, what? You know, like, I wanted to go to that tournament and compete. It's like, oh, okay. And then you're going to throw that kid into the competition with these lions. And they're going to get mauled. <laughs> right, and that kid's right. never going to want to do judo again. And yeah. you did the kid a disservice because he'll forever fear right, right. confrontation because he had a bad experience with it. And right. people are like, no, you got to be tough. You got to be there. A lot of it's luck, man. Right, right, right. You know, I don't That's care a- if you're super athletically gifted and you come from a mm-hmm. tough family and you're gritty and you do judo twice a week. You go in there against a kid that's bigger stronger mm. older done judo longer than you and that kid smashes you and you get injured you're not going to do judo anymore right so it's a fine so kind of yeah. yeah so the competition is another type of a business right uh-huh. get all the competitors of the area you collect the fee you pay the <laughs> mat space yeah and that's another type of a business and it provides a service mm-hmm. right, right? But then, and then you, you have to yeah. gauge if that's right service for the kids and whatnot. Exactly. Yeah. A lot of the times it's doing a disservice to say, okay, right. you know, the competition. And the problem with the competition too is like, you know, you have a competition team at the dojo and they get a cool right. patch and a cool shirt and all this stuff. And now all of a sudden you created a tier system at your right. dojo, right? right? First class citizens, you're a competitor, mm-hmm. right? Right. You've taken the vaccine. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> or you bought into the system. No. It's my, I, get, I gotta not say that, but yeah, yeah, first class citizens, right? I, yeah, so you don't want to, so yeah, you yeah, don't, you don't want to alienate people, people like that. No, yeah. you don't want to alienate people, and you know, because judo competition isn't for everyone, right? Right. And so, what you're trying to do with the kids program is make judo as fun as possible, so kids keep coming back to do ju- do more judo, and when they mm-hmm. do more judo because they love it and find it fun, they're gonna get better at it, right? And then maybe and then they want, day, yeah. yeah, they can compete. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, I guess we're kind of digressing from the business side, but like that all has to do with retention. Right. Right. Then, Finding the motivators. Uh-huh. Right. And maybe the motivator is competition for some kids. Right. So and then maybe, you know, you have to scratch that itch. Yeah. Right? And that carries over to the adult side. I mean, you know, always there's mm. a, like a bit of a division between hobbyists and serious competitors, even for adults. And yeah. How yeah. did you handle that in terms of retention? Well, you know, the problem is when the higher level guys are beating on the little guys, mm-hmm. the lower level guys, and they're like, oh, I am going easy. 
It's right, like right. that makes me so angry because it's like mm-hmm. you, you're going easy for you. But do you right, remember right. when you were a white belt, when you were a brittle, out of shape person mm-hmm. that sat on the couch the majority of your life mm-hmm. and then you came in to change your life around and you got lucky you never got hurt. You got mm-hmm. lucky the people around here supported you and helped you grow. Right. Now you're on top. Now you've been doing it for five years and now you're going to be like, oh, these guys are soft. Or, oh, mm-hmm. man, you know, I am going easy on these guys. It's like that guy, I am going to, you know, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to that guy. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because that's not right. You know, right. you have to try to put yourself in their shoes and I try my best to do that, you know? Mm. So sometimes it's managing that, managing mm. these interactions. Mm. And it starts with these little small, I don't want to call them microaggressions, but these like little backhanded things are like, right. you know, when the bigger person goes with the smaller person, like, oh, don't crush me, okay? Or like these little nonsensical right, right. stuff, right? And that kind of stuff escalates and that kind of stuff, you know, digs deep, right? Death by a thousand cuts. By a thousand cuts. Yeah, man. So it's like I I try to manage that. And that's very important. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, having the beginners have a beginner Mm -hmm. session was beginner centric. Mm -hmm. And, you know, seven to eight for us was that. Mostly Uh drills and skills. Mm -hmm. Seven to eight. Maybe we'll do a little bit of live for the beginners. Right. It's beginner centric. It's drill centric. Mm -hmm. If you're a black belt and you came, you were there for the beginners. Right. Right. If you're a black belt and you came, you're competing. Tuck yourself in the back corner and, you know, do your own thing. That's fine. But mm-hmm. keep to yourself, right? Mm-hmm. And that was kind of the situation. Right. You know, everyone was nice. Uh, mm-hmm. And that was kind of the thing. And then 8 o'clock comes around. We do conditioning. They do a little bit of live. White belt center class. Okay, mm-hmm. done. White belts and yellow belts go home. If you want to stay and watch, you're more than welcome to watch. They sit and watch and they watch these guys, mm-hmm. right? Pounding each other, just hammering away mm-hmm. at each other, right? Like mm-hmm. slamming each other, cranking on their arms. And they're like, wow, I want to do that. Right. And I say, that's the most fun you'll have in judo. But it takes a while to get there, right? right. Look forward to it, you know, mm-hmm. eyes on the prize kind of a deal. And you want to protect them from themselves and you want to protect them from that. Right, because right. that's really dangerous stuff, man. Mm-hmm. You know? So how did you, so I know you talked about like giving out patches and stuff like that for yeah. kids. Did you use any kind of extrinsic motivation for adults too? You know, not so much, mm-hmm. right? I like teaching adults. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I want to teach people who want to learn. Right. You know, I want to teach people who care, who are very invested in themselves too, right? Because mm-hmm. that makes me feel fulfilled as well, right? That's mm-hmm. sort of my motivator, personally. Right. right. Helping these people who deserve to be helped, helping those people who are helping themselves, mm-hmm. right? And it kind of gives me this feeling of like accomplishment and well-being. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So if one of those people start falling off and not coming, and you know, I, I'll reach out to them and be like, hey, what's going on? Right, right. right. When you go, we miss you at the dojo. We, we do. We really do. You know, it's yeah. a genuine thing, you know? Mm-hmm. So, like, that's a, a motivator for a lot of these guys. You know, when Sensei reaches out. Right, Oh, right. I care. I really do care, you know? Mm-hmm. And then, you know, if you're... Yeah, so it's, it's like that's sort of a motivator for adults. And some adults are motivated by rank. Mm-hmm. And some adults are just motivated to come in and make friends. Mm-hmm. Right? Have a sense of community to belong to. Right. Right? And then that's a big one. For mm-hmm. adults, because you could get isolated. You're at work, right? Right. right. Navigating like the political minefield of like mm-hmm. office politics and this guy and that guy and your friends, but not really. And you're kind of like frenemies almost, right? Mm-hmm. At work, you mm-hmm. deal with that. You know, you see the same people every day. You go home. Your <laughs> wife is that. You know, there and that. so like you kind of want and seek out that sort of camaraderie. Right. 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 And so having a place for those people to go to that's huge. Right. And that takes me managing that. Right. right. Managing. Not micromanaging, but these interactions when a black belt says something or does something that can potentially, right, take away from that experience. Like, I'm monitoring that really closely. And I'll say it at the end of the class. You heard right. me say it. Yeah. That's the way interact with each other. Be respectful. Yeah. yeah. You know? And, uh, that- yeah, man, it's like, don't hurt me. Or I had a guy one time say, like, to not even, you know, just the other day even. It's like, right. hey, sensei, like, is it okay if I throw this guy? Mm-hmm. Like, can I throw him? Like, can I go a little bit harder with him? It's like as you're implying that you've been going easy with this guy. Right, right. It's kind of you know, putting, down, putting him there's down. There's already yeah. a skill gap there. Yeah, Everyone yeah. knows that there's a skill gap there. Everyone doesn't need to know that you're taking it easy on this. I'm taking it easy on this guy. Can I go a little bit harder on this guy? Like that's a dick move, man. And right, I'm, right. I have zero tolerance policy with that shit. Yeah, I see. You know, because it's like it doesn't feel good being on the receiving end of that. Right. You know, you work hard all day. You know, grinding a nine to five, you come to the dojo, you want to work out, feel good, and get better. 
right? You want to come to a community right. where you feel safe and you feel like you belong. And all of a sudden, this guy's singling you out. Like, yeah, oh, this guy sucks. I'm good. Like, I can take it right. easy on this guy. I'm doing him a favor, right? I'm the good guy here. Like, oh, cool, right? All right, yeah, yeah, fuck. Go for the Yeah, yeah, you're doing good. Whoa, 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 <laughs> you got me. It's like, you know what, man? I, it you know, like work. that kind of stuff yeah. really pissed me off. So managing that, it's important because we know that one of the biggest motivators for adults to come is being is in, in that, that group. community. Yeah. In that community. Right? So that kind of touches on uh, the fact that sometimes businesses have to essentially choose customers too, just like the customers choose have businesses. To. Have yeah. to. Yeah. 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 So you have to have like sort of a value add system almost. Right. right? And right. it's not something to like, uh, like monitor and keep, but it's always sort of in the back of my mind. Right. Right. You know? There are people in the dojo mm -hmm. who isn't a plus one, man. They're like a plus three, plus five. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just not in a, in a monetary value way, but like they just add so much to the community. Right, they're right. Friendly, they're kind. That's the guy that everyone wants to do randori with. Mm -hmm. That you can't get around with. Mm. My cousin Eugene is a mm -hmm. great example of that. Right? right, you can get around with Eugene. Right, because right. when he walks into the dojo, everybody wants to drill with him. White belt, yellow belt, green belt. Right. right, brown belt, black belt, Everyone. women, kids, adults, everybody want to work out. Eugene, you want to go? Eugene, can you work out with me? And Eugene's like, oh man, I'm so sorry. Like I already have somebody, and we already said that. You know, he Everyone called me last last Thursday, yeah. and he I promised him, you know, Monday that I'd yeah. work out with him. Right, like that's a value add, like a you know, mm. it's a plus ten, plus right. twenty. You were like a negative ten because you heard all my <laughs> beginners in the beginning. <laughs> I did. I mean, oh, this, yeah, you were the worst. You were the this worst. Is, oh my God. Um, I, I, I have to tell you guys, you know, I, it, Shintai was very good about it because, yeah, like yeah. you said, when I first joined, I didn't have that sense because I've never been, uh, tr I never really trained in that kind of community before because yeah. well, for me, it was always like competition, competition, and, you yeah. know, not like that. Yeah. So I, I, Shintai had to pull me aside and have a, a few talks, and I, I, it took me a bit, but I did change. A few? <laughs> let's just keep it out of you <laughs> yeah but yeah it's a interesting thing right because yeah. the goal of the th judo is to throw the other person right so you're in there you're like i'm here to throw the other person we're playing a game and the mm -hmm. game is throwing the other person right okay you grab the person you slam them they get right. hurt mm -hmm. all right from a business standpoint that person quits mm -hmm. okay that's that's lost and you know it's also like i've been teaching that guy for four months mm -hmm. and i, I kind of like them you know? <laughs> everybody liked them you know they're you know, maybe there's a, a, you know, girl in the class that has a crush on him that comes just because of him. Because yeah. he's a funny guy. He's a nice guy. We <laughs> like having him there. Yeah. He quits. She quits. Okay. Right, 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 right. Not a big deal, you know. Maybe he didn't, couldn't cut it. It was an accident. Yeah. And then another guy comes in and he's a brown belt, right? And Peter's like, I got him. Throws him no. with Taitoshi and the guy <laughs> tears his calf, you know? <laughs> Right, and then I'm just like, oh man, he would have been such a good addition for the the dojo I, because uh, like people could have worked out with him because he's a good big strong I guy. S I still remember that round. I still remember that round because I mean, yeah. honestly, that's what it is. I didn't think that was a hard throw, but you know, yeah. it doesn't. Yeah, work you like that didn't think it was a hard throw. Exactly. But, you know, you never know. But you know, yeah. that was like one of those that's like, all right, I got it because he was big, he was strong, he's wearing a brown belt. Yeah. Right. So you know, you never know who it is. And right. Right. Especially the guests with coming in with experience, right? So that's a double-edged sword too, right? Yeah, because you, you don't, don't know wanna, what their intention are. You want to send you know? out your enforcers, but then at the same time, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to beat them too bad them, to where yeah. they don't want to come back, right? And you don't want them to <laughs> beat you up too bad to where they're like, "Ah, right. this sucks." <laughs> you know, it's, it's a very, right. very sensitive. So I always right. like if there's a guest, you know, yeah. it's like, all right, first minute, feel them out. Second minute, throw them once. Third mm -hmm. minute, let them ride out and just tire them out. So right. now they got a session with me. They got taken down once. They didn't take a beating. And they're mm. like, okay, maybe next time I could get Tensei. Right, know? right. <laughs> they can never do that. They can never. But, yeah. <laughs> That's right. right? He's, so like, he's sort of the, he's... the methods, you know. Uh -huh. That's... But yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing with the value of the right. people in the room because you're not just, you can look at it in a way where it's like, I want this much business. I want this much money. But for me, once I hit a certain level of, Right. Not say income, but like certain level at the dojo, I wasn't really motivated by, I need 10 students. I need 20 students. I need 30 students more. Like I wasn't mm. there anymore. Right. I just right. wanted to sort of keep the community going. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's for me too. Right. It's not purely altruistic or anything. That's for me because I go in mm -hmm. and that's my source of social connection and belonging. 
Right. You know, right. I get to hear these guys who are, you know, PhD programmers like yourself <laughs> talk to you. Yeah. yeah. You know, we have very, very intelligent people and I get mm-hmm. to interact with them and ask them questions about their field. Yeah. Right. And then make, you know, like, so that's what I like. I, I right. thrive on that. So, you yeah. know, um, yeah, that's yeah, the way that's I like good. to approach. Yeah. Yeah. My so they, program. So you've now grown your business. You've retained a lot of uh, core, very yeah. value add people. And now the problem is you can't do it all. All of the running the business and teaching judo. And on the unit help, you need to hire people. Yeah. So how did you go about doing that? It's, it's, it's a tough one, man. And you yeah. know, there's two ways, right? You could actually seek externally finding, right? Mm-hmm. But you're not pulling from a big pool if you're teaching something like judo. Right. Right. Okay, you know, I need to hire a programmer. There's a lot of programmers. I need to hire a lawyer. There's lots of people who just come out with law degrees. Mm -hmm. Oh, I need to hire someone who's going to teach judo for me. Right. How many people know judo? How many people can teach judo? How -hmm. many people have the same mindset as me in terms of safety and Mm -hmm. personal growth and all this stuff, Mm -hmm. right? So a lot of the times the best way to hire, I think, in the dojo setting is your homegrown guys, people Mm -hmm. who are going to help you, right? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of uh, another one that's kind of tricky because – once you develop someone to teach for you, you're essentially developing someone who is your can potentially be your competitor, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And people expect this like loyalty forever sort of a situation, especially right. martial arts, right? Like right. I trained you, I built you. How can you ever leave me and start your own dojo? It's right. so freaking selfish. Uh-huh. It's like that's just kind of messed up. You have to almost expect them and want them and give them the blessing to leave when they're ready to leave. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. and it's re- very annoying. So kind of like the pipeline system, you always want to have a couple people that's sort of in line to be mm-hmm. able to teach classes, knowing fully well that they may start their own. Mm-hmm. So then the next person comes up through the ranks. Next person comes up through right. the ranks. Right, you know, right. There's ways to do it in a way where it's not deceiving and mm-hmm. it's not messed up, right? I've mm-hmm. known, you know, the martial arts schools mm-hmm. that were like oh you know you uh, learn my way and you teach for me and one day you'll have a dojo like me and you'll have mm-hmm. this many students and you'll have this much money because two hundred dollars a month and you have a hundred students that's 20 grand a month and mm-hmm. you, know, you can make a quarter million dollars a year teaching this stuff you know like right. just stick with me and it's like sensei i want to start my own dojo now it's like no you have right you're not ready yet or something like that yeah, yeah it's kind yeah. of messed up and yeah. you know people do this thing of like this indentured servant like you're teaching for me the beginner right. class, and it's part of your training. And I'm not right. going to pay you. Your payment is learning how to teach. You know, and people do this kind of stuff. Right. You know, and I'm kind of against it. Uh-huh. You know, but you have to have sort of a pipeline of instructors that are sort of homegrown. Right. You know? And every now and then I'll get people with experience elsewhere that are great mm-hmm. who mm-hmm. are seeking a job. Mm-hmm. Right. But, you know, the biggest disservice is taking someone off their current path. Mm-hmm. And be like, you don't need to go to college. Why would you do that? Come teach judo for me, man. There's a future in it. You know, that's right, messed right, up. Right. I don't think that should be allowed. It happens mm-hmm. all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, and people are vulnerable at a young age and impressionable. Right. And there's this guy standing in front, you know, with all this charisma teaching martial arts. It's like, I want to mm-hmm. be like that guy. It's like, you can. All you right. got to do is teach 18 classes a week for free. <laughs> and your payment, right? Is the experience. Is the experience. <laughs> I'm collecting all. I'm taking all the money and put it in my pocket. Uh, all right. But good job, you know, kid. And Right? So... So you, you know, have to look out for up. this. You you have to look out for the you know potential teachers in your amongst your students that are coming up, and then you gotta yeah. treat them fairly. Yeah, you do. And you know, for me, I was very lucky. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, because a lot of these guys who ended up teaching for me, they did it. You know, through their own mm-hmm. choosing, right? Mm-hmm. Hey, you know, I want to help. People approach right. me. Can I help with the kids' classes? You mm-hmm. know, I've had people who uh, I don't like teaching kids' classes. You know, mm-hmm. and I'm like, okay, God bless you. Mm-hmm. You know, George's like that. George's <laughs> like, I want to help. And he's like, okay, you know, and then he was helping and doing stuff. And he was like, kind of, you know, teaching kids' classes. After a while, he's like, I don't really like teaching kids' classes that much. Right, I'm like, right. okay, you don't have to like it, man. You don't have to do it. Mm-hmm. Done. No hard feelings, man. It's okay. Right. You know, do you but, want to still answer phone calls? He's like, sure, I'll do that. I'm like, okay. He really enjoys talking to, you know, the students on the phone and then trying to follow up with them yeah. and whatnot. I mean, right yeah. now, I have no employees. Right. Right, because right, it's yeah, I'm coming off as on. like this great person, great employer. I had to fire everybody because I had no money coming in, you know, right. because of the pandemic. Oh, right, you know? right. But you know, they're getting unemployment and stuff. It's okay. Right. You Hopefully, know, it'll get back. Now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, hiring is important, man, because yeah. it's very, uh, you know. And I've had some great employees, and I had uh. some bad employees, and uh. you know, uh, 
managing people period is such a weird thing right you know, because you're managing people you know yeah. just the thought of that There's... you're trying to control someone to do something you're paying for their time mm-hmm. so like on like a philosophical fundamental level i'm kind of like you know a little bit weirded out about it you know what mm-hmm. i mean <laughs> it's like you come here do what i say and i'll give you money you know right. so it's kind of a weird situation you know, I, I like taking the approach of like, look at me, I'm doing this thing. If you want to help me, you can. And mm. if you do help me, there's, I can compensate Sorry, you. expectations. Yeah. Right. In, in a fair way, you mm. know, and. Right. You know, that's sort of the way that I approach it, which isn't the right way. I'm not saying this is the right way. Right. A lot of the stuff that I do is not a good business move. For mm-hmm. instance, people aren't required to buy my gi. People mm. go on Amazon, buy their gi. People are going to mm. have differently branded geese from other dojos that walk in i already have a gi i'm like okay mm. you can wear it mm. i've never you know trying to right right i've heard people do that well, you have mm. to have a white gi in the dojo and you have right. to have our logo on your chest right and that's good right. business right in so many right, ways right. because it's like okay every person that comes in has to purchase a gi now that's mm. good business adds to the bottom line mm. you know but some people hate that you know i'm not right. buying no gi i can wear your gi <laughs> you know uh yeah. But, you know, some people are like, hey, it's a uniform mindset. Uh-huh. You know, we're all in this together. We're on a team. Uh-huh. We have to brand this the same thing. Mm-hmm. Right? So, like, I don't do that. I don't sell, you know, Gatorade. Right. I've tried it. It was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, there's so Big many Gatorade. things that I could yeah. potentially do that uh-huh. I don't do. You know, like, merch sales, I rarely ever do it. Because I know? think it, it sometimes if it's not... It could take away... If it's not done well, it could take away your focus from the main thing, which is teaching judo. Like yeah, I don't want to do anything things. that distracts yeah. me from the dojo. Right. I, I like my dojo setup. That's why it's a lifestyle business. It's not like yeah. a great business. It's a great lifestyle business for me because mm. I walk into the dojo. I don't have to touch money. I don't have to deal with billing. Mm. I don't have to deal with phone calls. I don't have to deal with none of it. I walk mm. in. I teach judo. I'm there to teach judo. If you want to learn judo, I'm there to teach you. Right, right. right. Hey, I've never seen you before. Mm. Show me Osoto, sensei. Oh, I forget you, you know. Mm. Like I want to teach the people who really want to learn, who's committed to learning. You're mm. coming back every week and you're you're teachable, you're coachable, mm. you're asking the right questions, you're a good part of the community, you're value add to every mm. human in the room. I'm going to teach you. Right. right. And I'm so, going to look to see what you need and I'll teach you what you need to learn. Right. Kind of like that. That's the, how, the way I like to set it up. Right. But that's me personally. Right. So while we're on the topic of, you know, hiring people and managing your employees and whatnot Mm. and you just finished your mba yeah and i'm sure you've you guys have learned a ton of amount about managing people and hiring people so are there some of the things that you learn that you do in your Mm. business now or some of the things that you did you learned but you didn't take uh, in yeah. reality. So can we talk about a lot of Yeah, the, the, I think that, one yeah. of my biggest takeaway, and I've already sort of mentioned this lifestyle business idea. Right. right? We did a case study on like a bread company and mm-hmm. you know they made sandwiches and bread and they wanted to expand and they wanted to be a franchise and these venture mm-hmm. capitalists came in, they wanted to fund it and make it a national chain. Right. But it was like a mom and pop shop. They were just happy, right? Mm-hmm. Delivering bread to schools and having this type of a lifestyle where they have control over everything. Like their goal wasn't make millions and millions and millions of dollars and have to deal with these corporate people and have to like that's what wasn't their goal. Right. right. So they were trying to hire a board to, you know, do certain things and grow certain ways, but they had a lot of resistance from the family because the family didn't really like it like that. Mm-hmm. Right. And then essentially at the end of it it was like it's a lifestyle business for the family. Right. Right. You know, and right. I, I really liked that sort of mentality and I was like, oh, that's what I am. Right. Mm. Because I initially thought I wanted to have a dojo of a thousand people. Right. I wanted to have, you know, five dojos in the city and three overseas or whatever it is and have Mm -hmm. a franchise. And, you know, I initially kind of thought like that would be kind of cool. That's Mm -hmm. a lot of money. You know, you have a thousand students paying $200 a month. That's $200,000 in just revenue from tuition. Yeah. In a monthly basis, that's $2.4 million a year. Right, right, right. right. So I was like, oh, that's cool if I can make that much money, Mm -hmm. you know, doing teaching judo and having this and that. But, you know, the headaches of training everybody and trying to do quality control across the different franchises, mm-hmm. it's just not worth my time and my effort, right? Right. So it helped me really hone in on what I really did want mm-hmm. from the dojo. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to keep it, you know, I want to keep it a lifestyle business for me. Right. You know, right. I want to keep the legacy of the dojo, the way my father ran it. Mm-hmm. And I also don't want to spend, you know, 80 hours a week on it. I don't want to spend 40 hours a week on it. Right. I want to show up, teach the people, and it's just a great community of people who want to learn. Right. right? Kids and adults. Kids a little bit different. You you gotta you know before you start the business you kind of have to 
sit down and think about this, right? Like, is it what's the goal? It's not just. I don't think you could think about all of it because ah, you can't okay. really know some of this stuff. You know, right, like, right. what is my biggest motivator with the kids program? Mm-hmm. You know, a good example is Jake. Right, you know right. Jake. He's a great yeah. kid. I've known the kid since he was eight. He was going through mm-hmm. a hard time, whatever it mm-hmm. was. Came to the dojo, loved judo, did judo all the way through. He's eighteen. Went away mm-hmm. from college. Didn't see him for four years. Came back. Now he's studying to be a lawyer. He still but that comes kid has back roots and works in the dojo. Out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not right now because of the pandemic, but right. he has roots at the dojo. Right. That's been you know going back 20, 30 years. Right. Mm-hmm. And he's gonna always dip in and say hi. Always, mm-hmm. hey, how are you? You know. Oh, yeah. you know, I want to learn a little bit more. I'm going to be back in. Mm-hmm. He's not going to stick around after eight months, but it's okay. Right. You know, and having the kids program and having like these, this rooted thing mm-hmm. is a great thing for me. You know, right. yes, the kids program is, is a little bit more lucrative than the adults. Right. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that's, that's what really gets me going with the kids program. Mm-hmm. You know, having these like, uh, you know, one of the things is like we had a grandma and a grandpa mm-hmm. bring their kid in, mm-hmm. you know, their son. To mm-hmm. do judo, and then that son had a kid, so they were bringing their grandkids oh, to the dojo, yeah. and That's they happened amazing. to have met at the dojo forty years ago. Oh wow, wow, right? wow! So it's three generations, uh, right, of this family have a relationship with the dojo, and the grandparents yeah. learned from my father. Right, 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 right. So like something like that, really cool. Right? Yeah, I want to keep that going. It's a right? legacy. Yeah, yeah, but I also don't want the dojo to feel like work. To where right, it's right, like right. I, you know, mull over everything. It's like, oh man, profit this and profit that, and revenue streams and mm. all these different things. And I need to add fucking merch sales, and I need to buy, mm. sell drinks, and mm. I need to work on the margins and cut costs. I don't want to do that. Right, 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 right. I just want an X number of people, people coming in, right? Just this intergenerational judo community, mm. and that's what motivates me. That's what makes it a lifestyle business. And the NBA really helped me hone in on that. Because initially, I, I thought myself as like a businessman, right? I'm a smart guy, yeah. a businessman. If I say so myself, <laughs> smart guy, right? You are, you are. But then are, I yeah. realized uh, being in that room, mm-hmm. I'm not one of those people. You know? It's, it's not that, it's not that uh, if you want to grow a business to become this international chain, it, it's not that it, that's bad. It's just like, yeah. it take, it's good for so, certain people, but it wasn't yeah. you. Yeah. Not for me. Not yeah. for me. It doesn't motivate me. Right, you know? right. Yeah, that's I don't cool. Really like Very working cool. that much, period. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm they already, say like that's my biggest thing right now. It's like, yeah. man, working just fucking sucks, right? Yeah. Like, you gotta go somewhere every day, you know, yeah. like the nine to five grind. You know, it's brutal. I've done it before. Right, oh, right, right. You know, it's, it's like yeah. nine to five, and yeah. But now yeah. you're just, uh, it's as if you're never working. Really, you're just. <laughs> doing I mean, the, now I'm working. <laughs> now I'm working for Fuji. Right? I'm selling oh, right, these. Right. I'm yeah. a, in charge of the international business. Right, but, right. You know that too was a blast. That's another thing you could do in mm. you know e-commerce and mm. you know martial arts merch, mm-hmm. right? Martial arts equipment. Right. You know, I'm working with Fuji now on the international division. I, both yeah. my dojos were shut down for a little while, and Leah yeah. Hadasha, who owns the business, who I've known for 20, 30 years of my life, mm-hmm. she was like, "Hey, you want to come work for me? You know, while mm. you know whatever it is, and give us some of your thoughts from your MBA." I was like, "I'm glad to help." Yeah, nice. And so now I'm working there. So now that we've talked about how to. Start a dojo, grow it, and maintain it, and manage it. Kind of. We talked about the way I do things, which is well, not yeah. the right way, probably. <laughs> no, I yeah. think it's it's it's, a, it's good for uh, to people to hear about this, so that you know they at least have yeah. a reference point. Because you you are successful in your own way. Yeah. I yeah. do have to say there is some survivor bias there also, mm-hmm. and the fact that I'm in a New York City where mm-hmm. there's tons of people and plenty of demand for service martial right. arts is mm. and you know there's not a lot of do- judo schools in the city too which helps right so right. it's not just me it's a lot of c- environmental factors that i can't control that mm-hmm. it's just straight up lucky right so i have right. to throw that out there just to make sure people don't think you know right 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 that i'm not trying to take credit of like oh it's because i'm so you know it's not that a lot of it is luck mm. smart and humble Shintaro. <laughs> <laughs> and good looking yeah i know <laughs> oh man <laughs> So now let's kind of shift gears to yeah. the other side. Like I have other business opportunities in the martial art. Like you mentioned e-commerce yeah. and merchandising yeah. on that. And then you're, you're now involved in that more so. Yeah. And now even yeah. social media too. So yeah, yeah. maybe let's start with social media because you, you started with yeah. your YouTube channel recently and it grew a lot. Yeah. yeah. I feel like this could be a completely separate Oh, podcast yeah. too, right? Yeah, uh, but we, we could just touch about it. You touch know, uh, about it, and then we yeah, will move on to the yeah. e-commerce. Yeah. So I think, like you know, before brick and mortar dojo, mm-hmm. you were confined to the four four walls. Right. right. That's it. 
But now with like social media and the network effect and the reach that you may have through mm-hmm. the internet and stuff like that, you know, content creation, that's a real business now. Mm-hmm. You know, you have 10,000 followers, you have 100,000 followers, right? You mm-hmm. can do sponsored ads and, mm-hmm. you know, brands would reach out to work with you and all this stuff. And that's a, a way to make money too. Right. Not a lot of money, mm-hmm. you know, but YouTube is one that I do. Like I teach judo anyway, and I like mm-hmm. teaching judo and I teach what I teach in the dojo to my YouTube audience. Yeah. Right. The more views I get, the more ad money that they give me, uh-huh. which is a good thing. You know, I'm not mm-hmm. making a lot, you know, mm-hmm. but. But it's good. Yeah, it's yeah, it's good. Yeah. You know, it's a way to be able to put yourself out there, mm-hmm. I think, and then gain advertisement revenue. And mm-hmm. if you have a product to sell, like a video series, which mm-hmm. I do, right, mm-hmm. uh, you can do that and then reach right. the, a wider audience. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one way to, you know, another way of running bi- yeah. a business in martial arts world. How about yeah. the e-commerce side? What, what have you learned so far with working with Fuji? Mm, you know yeah. e-commerce that's it's just actually you know not nothing to do with martial arts too right you create mm. a product you add value right. to it you know mm. you take a commodity or something and you build it and then mm. make it into something cool that people want you market it and then people buy it mm. you know and what you put into it it's got to be less than what you get out of it right mm. <laughs> <laughs> just like that's just how it is and you know i think in the martial arts world right there's equipment that you'll always need to do the martial arts like geese right. and rash guards and things like that Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's sort of a very, it's crowded, but there's only, it's very concentrated at the top. You know, mm-hmm. Fuji is one of the biggest brands in the world, I think. Right. And it's one of the top, top dogs. And it's always been there, you know, in mm-hmm. 20, 30 years. Right. right it's right. a very long history. So, you know, it's an interesting world of business. Mm-hmm. And a lot of these, the barrier of entry is pretty low. Right. Because it's not like, you know, if you're trying to compete with Boeing and Airbus and you want to make airplanes for a living, the right, right. is really high. Right, right, you need right, right. Engineers, you need tons, tons, tons of money and resources to do this. Mm-hmm. You don't need that many resources; just start your own gi brand. You mm-hmm. know. By the way, Fuji does private label, so if you want to <laughs> <laughs> create your own gi through Fuji, you could definitely so, do that too. So I was, I was Great actually going to ask, like having, yeah. like finding a supplier, designing and whatnot. That thought yeah. that kind of would raise the barrier of entry, but you could outsource it essentially to. Yeah, so established it's a service companies. Now that yeah. a lot of these big companies provide, especially Fuji, they do a great job with it. Mm. You can try to source your own factory, but it right. comes with a lot of headaches, right? International stuff, value add taxes, and right. you know issues and factories, and you know just even like you, get, you have to have a basic knowledge of like supply chain management if you're gonna have a factory and make right. it and do this right. and sell it and market it. You can't do everything by yourself; it's impossible. Mm-hmm. But if you contact a company like Fuji, man, it's like, a, they're not even paying me to do this, right? But, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're paying me, you know, for work, but, yeah, uh, you know, just a little plug. Uh, you know, if you contact Fuji, like, hey, I want to make Peter Yu judo geese. Right, right, right. You right. could work with their designer uh, and have Peter Yu designed gi, mm-hmm. right? And then they could put it into production at Fuji's factory. Fuji has right, a factory, right. right? And then all of a sudden now it's going to cost you X amount of dollars per unit. And now you just sell it at a, Right price, and now you collect the difference, right? Interesting. But if you have a social media presence, and you could yeah. do like if you have a hundred thousand subscribers, and then you make your own gi, uh huh, right? And then you can sell to your subscribers. Hey guys, this will right. help me out greatly. I'm trying this thing. Mm. I want to design gis for a living now too. Please check mm. it out. And that kind of thing goes a long way, right? You know? I mean, so not too many people are doing it because I p- think people don't know, right? Right, right. Oh yeah, and I that's think part I- of the yeah. yeah. Because yeah, I I have no idea about this bit side of the business. So I I yeah. didn't even know you could do that. Like just use, label, yeah, you can yeah, do that. As a Fuji service. has the best prices. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we <laughs> should but, make a gi for our show. Oh, that would be amazing. Yeah, and we get your face and my face embroidered <laughs> on the chest. <laughs> that would be very cute. <laughs> and then no nobody would buy it. We'd be sitting on hundred units <laughs> in like my parents' <laughs> attic. <laughs> yeah, well, I've done that before. Gi you, pants and pockets. Gi pants. I that that was a good idea. You, good idea. you you've uh you've sold it all, no? Like No, I sold all the black ones. Oh, the white the black ones. Black ones sold out. Oh, the white ones sat are... around. Uh-huh. And now they're sitting in my parents' attic. <laughs> do There's your parents them. like him? Do they no. do they wear them? No. I, they, they're nice about it. <laughs> they give it to their friends as oh, gifts. <laughs> that's nice. And it's probably like the worst thing someone could receive. They're like, "What the hell am I going to do with this?" <laughs> They're comfy. <laughs> they have pockets. Yeah. And yeah, but the pockets are a little too shallow. Oh, well, maybe they, uh, version two has to come out now. 
version two, the version two, I actually have a mock-up, have a design, have a cut, everything. It's a lot oh, better wow. than version one. Version one, I didn't realize it until I actually started wearing it, and then the phone kept coming out of my pocket every single right. time I sat in the car, and I was like, "God damn it!" Yeah, you know? <laughs> maybe uh, it, that could be like a little march for the podcast if people want it. You know, let us know. I guess. <laughs> Higashi pants with pockets. Yeah. Higashi Don't buy show. the version one. It's not that good. <laughs> he's, you can't he's even a, buy it now online. You can't even right. buy it online anymore. But he's you know, a, version two. Mm. If we do a version two, it's going to be a lot better because right. we're going to use the material used on the Elemental Gi pant. Yeah. Uh, oh, which okay, is like okay. Unbelievably soft, 100% cotton. And then uh. we're going to make the pockets deeper and add a back pocket. And then we're going to use bungee drawstring cords. You're so, big on that bungee. I was about to ask you. It's going to be bungee cord, yeah, the yeah, next version two. Yeah. So based on those three little adjustments, mm. and we're not going to make white, we're just going to make black. Mm. People are going to buy it and people, it'll sell out. Mm. But I just haven't pulled the trigger on it. Just I can't, I can't, I don't have the time right now. Well, you got, you know, p- listeners and yeah. your YouTube channel fans, please let Shintaro know if you guys would like some, some of these pants. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe that'll happen. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, there was a good overview on the business side of things in martial arts. Um, anything else you would like to add or that we uh, kind of missed? Yeah, I mean, there's other ways to make money, right? We talked right. a little bit about the dojo business. We talked about like the franchising model, different mm. models, different motivators. We talked mm. about social media, like you said, and e-commerce, e-commerce all that stuff. Yeah. You could also be a professional judo athlete or a professional jiu-jitsu athlete. Right, right, right. That's another route. And you could find your own personal sponsors, like if you're capable of driving mm. this message of like, hey, this is my dream, and you get people to follow you on that mm. dream because you're an excellent communicator. People do that. You know, that's right. one way. I think there's a lot of ways to make money in the industry, mm-hmm. you know, but if you're doing it because you want to make money, I think you're already sort of losing. Right. Because if your ultimate goal is to make money, go be a banker. Right, know? right. <laughs> or do something else that actually has a lot more money. Right, know? right, to, right. Go into dermatology. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right yeah, yeah so this- i do the judo business because i love it you know i love right. the industry i love the people i've grown up with it you know mm. uh, and there's sometimes i'm kind of like oh man you know i would like to be able to say that you know mm. different occupation like when you're like oh i'm a phd in program and i'm a software engineer i'm like mm. wow right it's like sometimes i'm like i'm a judo teacher and some people are like oh you teach like little kids judo and uh, give out tig- tiger patches and i'm like <laughs> yeah essentially <laughs> you know, at the fundamental level yeah kind of you know but yeah there's yeah. a lot of ways to do it right you know, i think you have to love it and if you love it it'll happen for you and uh if you want to find me on instagram or something you can mm-hmm. and you could ask me questions i just wrote like three emails someone asking me about this that's why right. i came up with the idea of doing this one i see i see yeah it's like hey i'm starting a dojo in brazil can you help me out can you give me some yeah. tips yeah hey i'm starting a dojo in you know whatever state Mm-hmm. You know, one of the smaller states in the United States. I'm like, yeah, okay. If you have any questions, you know, right, I'll answer them for you. Nice, nice. But, you know, the way I do it is very different because my motivators are different. My biggest thing that I value in my dojo business is my time, right? Right, freedom right. Freedom to be able to go in later in the afternoon, teach some classes, teach only the people that I like. Mm-hmm. I don't want to teach everybody. Right, right, right. Everybody doesn't deserve. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's kind of messed up. But like, you know, they're going to get to learn in the class, but like right. the interactions that they get with me, that's like another, another level. And it's not something you could just buy, right? Because right. everyone pays the same amount. Right, right. You know, so it's not something you could just buy and purchase. You buy in to be a part of the community. Mm-hmm. And that's sort of the way that I like to run the dojo, you know? Yeah. And you know how it is. You were there for many, many years. Yeah. I love you it there. You drank the Kool-Aid. Ha, I fully <laughs> did. I fully did. I mean, I'm one of those core members you know Peter, you should just quit your phd come back and teach my kids classes for me yeah <laughs> would i for be able free. to would i be able to make millions of dollars if Dude, i stick think it about out it for man this? if you have ten thousand <laughs> students bro it's right. like two million a month bro oh sensei take me yeah. in to their tutelage <laughs> <laughs> well that's good that's i think you you're uh you point out a good f- your point about having to love what you do i yeah. mean that will carry you through. I mean, you, whatever you do, you're going to, you know, run into tough times. But if you love love what you do, you're going to be able to persevere through it. It's and, true. 
yeah, yeah. I think that's a good, very good point. On that note, uh, thanks for listening, guys. Um, Thank you very much. Thank let you, us, Peter. Let us know about the pants if you guys want some. Any yeah. questions for Shintaro, you know, yeah. find them on Instagram or YouTube and or uh, this podcast. So stay tuned for the next episode and then we'll see you guys soon. Yep. Thank Bye. you, guys. Bye.